If you're looking for a nice beginner telescope for under $200, I'd recommend a refractor telescope with an equatorial mount. I have two such telescopes here, both by Celestron. This first one is the Power Seeker 80EQ. A refractor telescope has a lens at the front of the telescope that the light passes through, as opposed to a reflector telescope, which has a mirror at the rear of the telescope that the light bounces off of. This second telescope is the Astromaster 70 EQ. The 70 refers to the diameter of the objective lens. It's 70 millimeters or 2 and 3 quarter inches. The EQ refers to the equatorial mount, which is something that you're going to want if you're going to use this for looking at the moon and the planets. The reason that I recommend a refractor as opposed to a reflector is that most people want their first beginner telescope to give them nice views of Saturn's rings, Jupiter and its moons, and close-up views of our moon without having to drive far from the city. The reflector telescope typically has less power, but is better suited for dimmer objects that can only be seen by driving far from the city. So to be realistic, we need to acknowledge that this telescope is going to be used for looking at Jupiter, Saturn, and the moon. Occasionally, you'll look at Venus and Mars when it comes around every two years. I also recommend that you get an equatorial mount like this one. You could get the Alt-As mount, like comes with the tripod for your camera, but that would be a mistake. It is, in fact, such a huge mistake that I'm going to spend some time trying to convince you not to make that mistake. The Alt-As mount, like on this camera tripod, allows you to move in altitude and azimuth. This is great for a camera or a spotting scope, but it's a disaster for a telescope trying to look at a planet, say Saturn. The reason is that it takes a long time to get Saturn centered in the eyepiece. And because the Earth's rotating, Saturn will quickly drift out of the field of view. You have to constantly be moving the telescope to keep Saturn centered in the eyepiece. With the Al-Az mount, you typically have to move it in two axes. So you unlock the azimuth, you move the azimuth, you lock the azimuth. You unlock the altitude, you move the altitude, and you lock the altitude. Of course, anytime you lock an axis, it tends to make it move and you have to start over again. Also notice that anytime you're touching the telescope, there will be too much vibration. It takes several seconds for the vibration to dampen out. So while you're waiting for the vibration to dampen out, Saturn's moving across the field of view. What this means is that with the l mount, you will literally be spending more time pointing the telescope and very little time enjoying looking at Saturn. So you might ask, why is it that if the l mount is such a horrible thing for a telescope that the manufacturers keep making them? Well, they make them for the large aperture Dobsonians. Those are used typically for low power applications where the Earth's rotation doesn't matter. They would rather have the equatorial mount, but that would make it cost thousands more. They're also offered on the computer go-to telescopes. Well, if you have a computer and a motor moving the telescope, then the problem with the Alt-As mount is pretty much gone. And finally, they offer them on the beginner telescopes for the under $200 people. It's easier to sell you something that you can't use than to try to educate you on why you shouldn't buy it. Many new people don't understand the equatorial mount and may be a little fearful of it. For that reason, I want to spend a little time showing you how nice it is. Now, the equatorial mount has the locking nut for each axis. But to move it, all you have to do is turn one of these slow motion knobs and slowly move it in each axis. Now, if the alt as mount had these slow motion controls, so you don't have to keep locking and unlocking each axis, most of the problems I talked about would be gone but you would still have to move it in two axes most of the time. With the equatorial mount, you align it such that you only have to move one axis. So as Saturn drifts off the field of view, you turn it real quick until it's on the other side of the field of view, and then you let go, the vibration stops, and you get to watch Saturn as it drifts across the entire field of view. And then you do it again. So you spend most of your time looking at Saturn and very little time pointing the telescope. From our point of view, all the stars and the planet make concentric circles around the North Star. If you could take your Alt-As mount and 
point it so that this axis here pointed at the North Star, then you would only have to move one axis to take out the Earth's rotation. And that's essentially what the equatorial mount is. It's an al az mount that's been tilted so that this axis points at the North Star. It's really easy to set up. The first time you get the telescope, you set this to your latitude. This is a one-time thing. Once you do that, you lock it down, and you never need to do that again unless you go hundreds of miles north or south. From then on, the only thing you have to do is when you take your telescope out, is to set it down so that that thing points north. Then you just point your telescope, whatever the object is you're looking at, say Jupiter, lock it down, and then all you gotta do is move the one knob to take out the Earth's rotation. Very simple. I have two different Celestron telescopes, so let's look at the differences. This one has an 80 millimeter objective lens, a little over three inches in diameter. This one here has a 70 millimeter objective lens, or 2.75 inches in diameter. One advantage of having a larger lens is that it makes things look brighter. But remember that we will be looking at the Moon, Jupiter, and Saturn, and these things are already bright enough. If you actually did drive 50 miles away from the city, then you might notice that you can see dim things a little easier with the bigger lens. Another advantage of the bigger lens is that you can get more power before things get fuzzy. The difference between 70 millimeters and 80 millimeters is slight though. The tripod on the 70 millimeter telescope looks a little sturdier and the 70 millimeter tube is lighter than the 80 millimeter tube so I would think that this telescope would have less of a problem with vibration. The big difference between these two telescopes is in the eyepieces that you get with them. A really nice eyepiece can cost anywhere from $50 to $500. What this means is that for telescopes in the under $200 price range you don't get really nice eyepieces. Still, I am somewhat impressed with the quality of the eyepieces that come with these scopes. The power of a telescope is found to be the focal length of the primary lens divided by the focal length of the eyepiece. Both of these telescopes have a 900 millimeter focal length for their primary lens. Both of these telescopes come with a 20 millimeter eyepiece, which results in 45 power. The eyepiece that comes with the Astromaster appears to be somewhat better than the one that comes with the Power Seeker. It weighs a little more, and the hole where the light comes out is larger. There's a bigger difference when comparing the second eyepiece that you get. The Astromaster comes with a 10 millimeter eyepiece, giving 90 power, and the Power Seeker comes with a 4 millimeter eyepiece, giving 225 power. Telescopes that are sold in a department store often advertise that they have 600 power or some such ridiculous value. What this means is that they wasted money on some junk lenses that you will never use. With a name like Power Seeker, I was worried that this is what they did, and I was right. If you go to the Celestron website, you will see that they give the highest useful magnification for most of their telescopes. This number is 60 times the diameter of the primary lens or mirror in inches. So for an 80 millimeter lens, which is 3.15 inches, you would get 190 for the highest useful power. Mysteriously, the highest useful magnification is missing on the ads for their power seeker telescopes. This is because they all come with lenses that give you too much power. With too much power, the obje object is distorted and you will often choose not to use it. In addition, the power seeker comes with a three power Barlow lens. When you use this along with your eyepiece, you triple the power you would otherwise get. The Barlow lens that you get is extremely cheap. It probably cost around 50 cents. Now, after all the bad things I said about the Power Seeker, I will say that I was surprised when I looked at Saturn and the Moon using the 4 millimeter eyepiece. This is 225 power, where the recommended highest magnification is 190 power, and yet it wasn't that bad. I would write off the 3 power Barlow, but I would say that you can use both eyepieces, which give you 45 and 225 power. This power seeker would be a much better scope if you also bought a nice PLOSO eyepiece with a focal length of 6 to 10 millimeters. One of these will cost you about $30. Both of these telescopes come with astronomy software that's pretty cool. It shows you what the sky looks like for any given date, time, and location. You can pan around and zoom in and out. 
you will always know where to find the planets. So in summary, if you're looking for a beginner telescope for under $200, my personal recommendation is that you get a refractor with an equatorial mount. Look for one that comes with eyepieces that give you 50 to 100 power. Celestron has their power seeker telescopes that tend to come with eyepieces which give you too much power, but not totally worthless powers like you might get in a department store. Celestron also has the more sensible Astromaster telescopes. Comparing the PowerSeeker 80 EQ with the Astromaster 70 EQ, we find that the Astromaster costs a little more, comes with a slightly smaller objective lens, has a sturdier tripod, and comes with nicer eyepieces. I didn't mention it before, but the PowerSeeker comes with a finder scope with crosshairs, and the Astromaster does not. Instead, it comes with a piece of plastic that has an illuminated red dot in the middle. You're supposed to put the red dot on Saturn, but you can move your head around and get wildly wrong results. I think this was a marketing decision to trick people into thinking that they're getting something high-tech, but it just doesn't work. You'll have to find Saturn with the low-power eyepiece, and then switch to a high-power eyepiece. I have included information in the More Info section below, along with links to Celestron's website. You might also want to read the comments to see what other people think about what is the best beginner telescope for under $200.